We've already mentioned exon shuffling, but we're going to do it in more detail today. Let's begin with a review of the architecture of eukaryotic genes. Now, I say unusual here because if you were trying to record information, which is basically what the genome is, right? It's an instruction manual, a record of all of the things necessary to create an organism. And so if you were going to make an instruction manual, it would be a very strange thing to do to create important instructions and then intersperse them with filler, with mostly nonsense information. But that's exactly how the eukaryotic genome is arranged. We've already talked about this, that in the human genome, and it's more or less, but still the, the pattern remains for all eukaryotes. But in the human genome, only about one and a half percent of the entire genome is protein coding. The rest is non-coding DNA. And a large portion of that does not have a really immediate uh, big impact on the phenotype of the organism. It's there, it's in the, um, fills up much of the genome, but doesn't dramatically impact the organism. Now, that non-coding DNA is not complete junk DNA. That's a misnomer. If you've ever heard that term, it's not really a good one. Uh, but the phenotypic impact of the non-coding DNA is very diffuse. There are certain parts of it that might have a clear um, regulatory function, so they control genes being turned on and turned off. There might be parts of it, there are parts of it, that are structural, that are necessary for proper um, coalescence of chromosomes during uh, cell division, or that are telomeres, right? That's important, although it doesn't have a direct impact sometimes what the sequence is. The telomeric sequence is important to maintain integrity of chromosomes over many, many cellular uh, divisions. So it's not useless DNA, but it's not doesn't have a direct one-to-one -one impact for much of it on the phenotype of organisms like the protein coding portion of the genome does, okay? So let's take a look at this diagram. This is very diagrammatic. It's not net, uh, meant to be um, proportional. So for instance, introns are usually much larger than the exons are proportionally, usually about, oh, probably about eight to 10 times as long on average as uh, the exons are. But just to refresh your course, Promoter is a short region of DNA where the RNA polymerase binds so that we can transcribe the gene. An exon is part of the coding sequence of the gene. Okay, so what happens is the promoter binds the RNA polymerase. The RNA polymerase makes a long copy that is our um, proto-mRNA, the mRNA before it's spliced. That our mRNA is then spliced. The introns, which are the non-coding regions within the gene, are cut out. The exons are spliced together. There's usually a short region on either end between the promoter and at the end of the last exon that is also kept. That's the untranslated region. And then that becomes the mature mRNA that is then taken to a ribosome and translated into a protein. Okay, that's all review basic stuff. We won't worry about um, the enhancer silencers and transcription factors. That's involved with gene regulation. But I do want to point out that about 25% or so of the human genome is uh, exons. So that's a fairly large, I'm sorry, backtrack. About 25% is introns, right? The exons are the protein coding region. So that would represent the one and a half percent. But about 25% are um, introns of our entire genome. And so that leaves approximately 75%, a little more, a little less, that is the space, the un um, non-coding DNA between genes. Um, sometimes that's called intragenic space, uh, but it's all DNA sequence. Okay, so again, this is a little bit of a bizarre thing. And for a while, people, when they first started discovering this, this strange architecture, and by the way, this is quite different than prokaryotes. Prokaryotes have a much more compact genome meaning that they do have some non-coding DNA, but usually not very much. And so the vast majority of prokaryotic genes is made up of coding DNA. They only have a little regulatory and structural um, uh, places to initiate uh, replication of DNA. That doesn't make up a large chunk of their genome, but these structural non-coding uh, regulatory regions make up a huge portion of all eukaryotic genes. And so this was a mystery when it was first discovered. The main clue to figuring out what 
why this would evolve, why it has been kept and become such a huge part of eukaryotic genomes, that discovery came when people discovered that these exons corresponded many cases to these domains in proteins. And so it appears to be an adaptation for structural and functional recombination of genes into, well, at least a more likely chance of having a, a useful product come out of a recombination. Now, there are two theories about the origins of introns. One is that introns have evolved very, very early, at least in simple form. Uh, they evolved very early in life on Earth, and then over time, prokaryotes had selection pressures that removed um, introns from most of the prokaryotes. Now, we do find introns in some bacteria and especially in some archaea, but they're fairly limited. They're not a huge component of the genome, so they're there, but not really an important part of prokaryotic genomes. So the introns early hypothesis is that introns were kind of a component of all early life on Earth and then were maintained and um, elaborated on in eukaryotes, and there was selection to reduce and eliminate them in the prokaryotes. The competing hypothesis is an introns late, that introns for the first couple billion years of life on Earth uh, were not really there, or they evolved late and were not really a very important, never very, really became very important. Um, but in the one group of these weird, with these weird genomes in the eukaryotes, they suddenly gained uh, uh, evolutionary importance and became a critical, fundamental part of those eukaryotic genomes, but they evolved late. And there have been some suggestions to try and merge these two together. Um, as far as I know, and I'm not an expert in this field, there are still some proponents of both. But some people have tried to merge this with the idea that introns, in their very simplest form, self-splicing introns, may have been a component of all life on Earth and are maintained in some bacteria and, and lost in others, and, but were not really very important for them. And then became important and became more complex with proteins called spliceosomes as a protein complement that helps to splice out most eukaryotic um, pre-mRNAs into the mature RNA form, right? So we might be able to resolve this. So just be aware of the two competing hypotheses and that there's no real, real clear 100% answer for one or the other, but there might be elements of both. But this is the key idea is that introns are critical to, and kind of a strange way to arrange genes, but are critical for the, or, for the evolution of eukaryotic genomes. And so this makes eukaryotic genomes very, very diffuse, not very compact, right? There's lots of non-coding, not really important, but just a little bit important non-coding DNA, okay? And so we, when we understand that these exons might correspond to functional units, like maybe a binding site for protein, that might, um, another protein, that might correspond to one exon. The other exon might represent a transmembrane domain or a, an, an enzymatic uh, catalyzing site or something like that. And this is not 100%, but enough that it's, it's very clear that there's been some selection to break genes up based on these functional subunits, these domains, okay? And this is really critical because DNA spatial arrangement, really, which is just linear DNA, right? There's no cr critical importance for folding DNA into three-dimensional structure. It's just linear. Uh, and that has no relationship to the final three-dimensional structure. But when we see it broken down at exon, suddenly we have a link between the linear structure of DNA and the three-dimensional structure of the final protein. And so selection has worked on that to maintain that, and many introns are maintained over many, many um, millions and even billions of years of evolution. Okay? So what do we mean by exon shuffling? The most common mechanism, and oh, there are some others that play less of an important role, but the most common mechanism is when we get some form of ectopic recombination. Now that's a fancy term. Uh, it's a little bit general here. I'm, there's a specific example here, but there are two main types of ectopic recombination. So the name itself just means recombination at an unusual site, somewhere where it's not really supposed to be. Ectopic is a word you may be familiar with from um, the term ectopic pregnancy. An ectopic pregnancy results from when an egg implants 
in the fallopian tubes or sometimes even in the body wall if it gets out inside to the body cavity, but not in the uterus where proper implementation for development should occur in mammals. And so it's the same basic idea, but we get recombination at uh, the wrong site. So normally, during meiosis, uh, this is metaphase one of meiosis, these homologous chromosome pairs line up. And they line up exactly, and there are regions that are similar enough that make them line up very, very easily. And so if they swap parts, right, which is called crossing over and is a form of rec recombination, they d it's not really considered a mutation because they're swapping equal parts. In my Bio 1 classes, I always say, imagine that you had a dance partner. And you looked at each other across the room, and you said, wow, you have a beautiful arm. Your partner looks back and says, oh, I like your arm too, and you swap arms. There would be some genetic, well, in this case, physical, but the analog is the genetic differences of chromosomes. But you wouldn't have extra parts. They would just be maybe a slightly different combination of parts than you had before. However, if chromosomes line up unequally, and then they have a crossing over event, then we end up with a type of mutation that results in one chromosome having duplicated material. And so if this crossing over event occurred in the middle of a gene, and it's likely if it does occur in the middle of a gene, that it's going to occur in the middle of an intron, because that makes up the majority of genes, right? Roughly 10 to 8 to 1, or somewhere in that neighborhood, or 10 to 1 of genes is introns, and the remaining is exons. So just random crossing over is very likely to recombine them uh, in an intron, and keep the and and shuffle those exons around. So if this was, um, you know, we look at this a green uh, allele here, a, a orange allele of the same one. Now suddenly we have parts, or maybe even the entire gene, but at least part of that gene repeated twice in one of um, the chromosomes. Now as meiosis goes on, these centromeres will dissolve, and we will further subdivide these. And so you would end up the result of this, right? Would be you would have two gametes produced that were uh, wild type, like one of mom's or dad's, you would have one gamete produced that is missing the, this portion of the gene or this gene. And then you would have this one, this is the one we're focusing on, right, that has extra components, that has a um, maybe a motif, maybe an entire domain, maybe even an entire gene, but part of the gene recombined. So, this is a mechanism for gene duplication, but it's also, if it happens on a more narrow scale of duplication, it is the major force that causes um, uh, this exon shuffling, right? So we get one uh, gene that has multiple exons, and so they can be kind of moved back around almost as if they were modular components. And so we can think about that, and this is a good term to know. We can think about this quote-unquote strange arrangement of eukaryotic genes as a form of modularism that has been selected for because it allows for more possible beneficial uh, combinations. So this is another diagram showing the same thing. This is looking at it between entire genes on a chromosome with each letter here and, and shaded region representing a gene. But if it occurs in the middle of a gene and it's a little bit more limited in scope, then we end up with exon shuffling. Okay. Now. One other form of ectopic recombination, I guess we can use this slide, can occur, and this is rare, more rare, but can also result in some of these things we've been talking about, is if instead of homo homologous chromosomes, like 1A from mom, 1B from dad, right, those line up during a meiotic event, if uh, 1A lines up with 3A or 3B, a different chromosome entirely, and then crosses over, that is also a form of ectopic recombination. Now, those are less common historically, or they might be just as common, but natural selection is usually not kind to the results of those cross-chromosomal ectopic recombinations. These are usually a little less extreme in, in scope and scale. Uh, I give you some extra material on one of the um, chromosomes, like number three here, right? It gets extra material. And so therefore, um, uh, that can often be beneficial, sometimes not, and it's selected against. But over time, that has been a very, very common mechanism that has increased the diversity of the complement of genes and the different combinations of those parts of those genes in the eukaryotic genome. And in fact, as we evaluate this and get better and better, there are some parts of the genome that seem particularly predisposed to this type of recombination.
And so there are two things that might make a region of a chromosome a hot spot for genetic recombination. The rate of crossing over could be elevated in that area, or it could just be by chance it's in an area when recombination does occur, it's more commonly uh, benefit and, and natural selection does not work as hard against certain recombination events. And so really it's probably a combination of both of those things, but there are very clear parts of the chromosome that have higher recombination rates in general overall. And then there are other parts like centromeres and structural parts that have very low recombination rates. So it's not just a completely, oh, all, all places are equally likely to have these random mutational events that copy entire genes or copy sections of genes so that we have exon shuffling. Okay. And so this can create allelic variants, right, where we just might be shuffling two types and we get one functional gene and another one, right? So with equal crossing over, we get allelic variants, right? So here we swapped out one exon for another one. And so not only is this important for exon shuffling and duplication of domains so that we get kind of new versions of genes and new, new types, but it can also be a mechanism for increasing allelic variation, right? So... Maybe a better term on the, on this slide. I'm actually going to change this. Typically, um, let's just say equal crossing over, because you could have what would be defined as a new chrome as a new um, allele with unequal crossing over. But equal um, crossing over of homologous genes is probably a more common mechanism for allelic variants. Okay. And so not only does arrangement of exons increase um, the chance of mutations that kind of do Franken genes, maybe that's a, if that helps it stick in your head really, because a gene that gets extra material is kind of like a Franken gene, like mix and match. Maybe even this we could call a Franken gene, because I guess Frankenstein was a complete human made up of different parts kind of mixed and matched together. So we can have Franken genes that increase in size and have entire exons duplicated. And then we could have ones that are just swapping complement exons and just create a new allelic variant. Both of these are subject to natural selection. They're probably happening billions and billions of times over the history of the eukaryotic organisms where this isn't really important. And many, many, many of them have been selected out by natural selection. But a small number, but enough of them to play a really vital role, are beneficial. Natural selection creates um, a selection pressure to keep them. They become more and more common and they are part of the protein complement today. Okay, so these Franken genes, right, gene duplication events or ectopic recombination events, we can result in a huge um, increase over time in the complement of genes. And what we'll do is we'll spend a little bit of time looking at what some of these um, explosions in uh, diversity at the molecular level level May, re may be the result of these things occurring at the molecular level. There's some hints of that in the Pathy et al. paper. Um, I'm sorry, it's not an et al., it's just Pathy, the Laszlo Pathy paper. But we'll talk about that in um, a, a coming discussion in more detail. Okay? Um, and so we'll talk about how it's, correspond it's corresponding with the uh, origin of multicellularity and increase of the repertoire, right, the total number of proteins that are found in organisms and is especially important for cell-to-cell -cell signaling and cell-to-cell -cell connections, things that go along with multicellularity. And in addition to um, that, it also creates, can if you, so for instance, if we are duplicating an entire gene like a globin, then we have two copies of those genes, right? We create paralogs. One of them can then evolve and they often can then interact with one another to create these quaternary structures. This is a three-dimensional drawing of hemoglobin, which is two copies of alpha hemoglobin, two copies of beta hemoglobin that fold up independently and then interact in this uh, quartet of, of uh, polypeptides that interact together to make the complete more efficient uh, molecule for transporting uh, oxygen in our blood.